Let's generate our motivation. So attaining full awakening entails both the method side and the, and the wisdom side of the path. And the method side for the Mahayana vehicle is bodhicitta. The aspiration to attain full awakening for the benefit of all beings. And that aspiration is dependent on cultivating great love and great compassion for every sentient being. So that means that if we leave out any sentient being, even one of them, from the sphere of our love and compassion, then we cannot become Buddhists because we don't have the bodhicitta. We're not working for the benefit of all beings. So it's very effective to sit somewhere and look around and see all the sentient beings and think, my awakening depends on this one and my awakening depends on that one. And so if there's people you like around you, that's fairly easy to do. But it's interesting to do this sitting in the middle of a meadow where there's grasshoppers and wasps and ants and beetles and all sorts of critters that you don't even know the name of. And when you look at each particular one, to think that being is a cause of my awakening. Because dependent on that being, I will generate love and compassion for each and every sentient being. So thinking like this really makes you connect with all these living beings. Thinking, my awakening depends on that one. And then when you walk around in town or you look at the news, all the human sentient beings, you think, my awakening depends on that one. And sometimes you say that one and you think of that particular person, and you go, "Uh -uh. (laughs) uh-uh. I don't want my awakening to depend on that person. So right there, we see where we need to do some work. Because if we leave that person out of our love and compassion... Buddhahood is impossible for us at that time. So we've got to really work with our mind to open it to care about each living being, regardless of whether we like them or dislike them, whether they help us or harm us. And to have that kind of openness, it's very effective to remember that who somebody is at any particular moment is not who they always have been or who they always will be. In other words, they're changing all the time. And from one lifetime to the next, our relationship with them also changes. And so try doing this 
And especially if there's somebody who you're not getting along with at this moment, you know, really think, my awakening depends on that person. Uh, If I am angry at them and exclude them, I'm shooting myself in the foot. They're not harming me. I harm myself by getting angry at them. And so in that way, give them some space. Don't uh, freeze them into a mental image of somebody who has always been horrible, always will be horrible. That's not who they are. They're simply someone who wants happiness and not not suffering, just like us. So with this kind of motivation that cares about each and every living being and wants to attain full awakening to be able to benefit them most effectively, then cultivate bodhicitta as our motivation for being together and sharing the teachings this evening. Does that make some sense to you? Do you like it? (laughs) Or do you have some pleasure in holding grudges and saying to people, I told you so? Isn't that so gratifying? You give somebody advice and they don't do it, or you are in a meeting and you express your wonderful idea and they don't like it, and then you go along with their idea and it turns out to be a mess. And there's so much good feeling of, I told you so. If you had followed my idea and done it my way, it would have turned out very good. Yeah? Do you have some gratification from that? Yeah, there's a few people that are not acknowledging any gratification. (laughs) I wonder if they're the ones who do that the most. (laughs) Yeah. So it's interesting to see what we derive pleasure from sometimes. Sometimes it's really mm, kind of uh, corrupt. Okay, so we were, were in the middle of the chapter on afflictions, their arising, and their antidotes. And in that chapter, we're on page 112, the counter forces to the afflictions. And so uh, we've just begun to talk about this. We covered the first two paragraphs on that page. Last time we're on the third paragraph. So the first step in counteracting the afflictions is to notice when they manifest in our minds. Because if you can't see any dirt, you can't clean it away. Okay, so you've got to see 
the affliction when it comes in the mind. While we may believe that we know ourselves well, our thoughts and emotions often go unnoticed. Okay. One factor contributing to this is the lack of mindfulness and introspective awareness. Okay, so mindfulness, being aware of our precepts, being aware of our values, introspective awareness, monitoring our body, speech, and mind to see if what's going on with our actions corresponds with our precepts and our values. Okay, so when we lack mindfulness and introspective awareness, uh, we're, you know, we're spaced out, basically. Okay, and a very good way to see if you're spaced out is when you walk from one place to the next, when you get to the next place, ask yourself, what did I, what was going on in my mind the whole time I walked here from the other place? See if you can remember what you were thinking about. Okay, it's amazing how little we can remember of you know, if you walk from Gotami to to Ananda, how long does it take? Maybe two minutes, three minutes? But we can't even, we weren't even aware of what we were thinking about. Yeah. Or if you drive to work from here to there, you know, total blank. And yet something was going on. Yeah. Okay, so we neglect to focus our minds on what is beneficial and to monitor our mind's activities with wisdom. Sometimes we are distracted by sense objects and do not pay attention to our inner thoughts and emotions. Okay, so if you're walking down the street in a city, probably you're going to be very distracted by sense objects. You know, because you look in the window, uh, store windows, you look at all the people, you look at the cars, you know. And then as soon as you see these things, then the mind starts projecting, oh, I like this, oh, I don't like that. I want that, you know. And then you're off on, well, how am I going to get it? I could do this. I could work overtime. I could cut down on my Starbucks consumption. I could do this with this. And hmm, but do I really need that? Or maybe I want something more. And then you are off and, you know, in some kind of uh, other realm planning how you're going to get something. Okay. And, and you're not even where you're doing it. Hmm? Okay, so that's one thing that distracts us or that, or that inhibits us from uh, being aware of what's going on in our mind or identifying the afflictions. Another thing is some people uh, grow up in families where emotions and thoughts are not labeled or discussed. So they did not learn the vocabulary necessary to discuss the workings of their minds. Okay. So, so, you know, we're very influenced by our family. If our family is one that doesn't talk about emotions very much, then, uh, you know, you never really learn kind of what internal feelings uh, get labeled with the name of a certain emotion, okay? Uh, and, yeah, we, we just never learn how to do that because it was never modeled uh, for us by the adults we were around, okay? So, it, you know, it may seem funny to you that you don't know those words, but... You know, Eskimos have so many words for snow, different words for snow. But if you grow up around somebody who doesn't label all these different kinds of snow for you, then you don't even see the difference in them, and it, it all goes by you. Yeah. So the same thing. If you're raised in a family that doesn't talk about emotions, then... You know, everybody's having them, but nobody really is able to identify what they are. Yeah. 
and and to really know inside yourself what the um, the texture of different mental states is like what does doubt feel like in your mind and how do you know when you have doubt have you ever thought about that how would you describe the feeling of doubt to somebody else Whereas something like anger, we may be able to describe. We probably all learned the word, you know, for anger. But, you know, resentment, spite. Yeah, did we learn what word corresponds with an internal mental state for that? Okay, so that can, can be something that we, we have to just spend some time learning. Okay, so here are some tips to help you identify thoughts and afflictions. Okay, first, check in with your body. So our physical sensations often tell us a lot about what is happening in our minds. When our hearts are racing, our faces flush, and our stomach is tight, chances are we are feeling anger. Okay. Okay. So anger, which is often often is based on fear. Okay. Do you ever in your mind connect anger and fear? Yeah. Why why do you get angry when you're afraid? If you start out afraid, why do you get angry? Hmm? Yeah, explain the link. Because when I'm afraid, then I feel powerless and will be powered over, and anger gives me the... It's like being very, very big when you're around a wild cat. You make yourself super big, and then they can't... (laughs) They won't get you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so anger makes us feel big and strong. Okay. But what's the relationship between attachment and anger, or no, attachment and fear? Is there some relationship between them? Fearing that we won't get what we want, or that we'll lose what we have that we're attached to. Yeah. Okay. So we can actually go from one mental state to another one quite quickly and back and forth in several of them, uh, you know, without taking too much time. So to be able to to really identify those, and then also to identify what it was that set us off in the first place. Yeah? Was it something that had happened at, you know, one moment before? Or did we have a memory of something that happened a long time ago? And now we're reacting to it? Or are we imagining something happening in the future and we're reacting to that? Or are we, did we hear a story about somebody else and we're imagining being that person? Okay. So to, to really you know, observe this and see how our mind works. Hmm? Okay, when our palms are sweaty and our breath is short, we are usually, don't read the book. (laughs) Hmm? Afraid, anxious, nervous, agitated. Yeah. So, you know, watch your breathing. And watch whether you're breathing short breaths from up here or whether you're breathing longer breaths from down here because that will also relate to what's going on in your mind. Okay. I once saw um, uh, some kind of evangelical preacher on the uh, television when I was missed a flight or something, and they put me in a hotel. And 
this guy was, you know, giving one of his talks, and his the veins in his throat were bulging, you know? And I, I was thinking, what emotion is he feeling, you know? Because it was kind of this, you got to believe in well, you you know, uh, and it's like, well, what's the emotion that he's he f- feeling that his veins are bulging and his whole face was was red, you know, and flush, and is he even aware of what he's feeling at that moment? Yeah. So also, another way to figure out what a mental state's happening is check in with the mood in your mind. When thoughts about desirable objects are swirling in your mind, attachment's there. Okay? When you can't stand that somebody else is better than you in a certain activity, that's jealousy. <laughs> okay? There's a certain kind of You know, do you have a certain feeling in your body-mind when you're jealous that's different than a feeling than when you're attached to something? Can you identify those two feelings? Is it a physical feeling? Is it a mental mood? No. And when that's present, can you, you know, go back and say, okay, what triggered this? Uh-huh. Or, or are you uh, sometimes like I'm going along in the day, and then all of a sudden there's this. All of a sudden, it seems like, you know, there's just this strange feeling of you know something's not right, and it it means you know it, something's not right with my interaction with someone or something, and then I have to stop and kind of retrace what I've been doing uh, to find, you know, the, the incident, or not incident, but, the, you know, what, what happened that, uh, you know, made me feel uncomfortable. Not that made me feel uncomfortable, in which I felt uncomfortable. And did my feeling of, of uncomfort or discomfort, where did that come from? Okay, why am I feeling uncomfortable in that situation? Okay, so if you can, you know, follow these things back, you really learn a lot about yourself. And similarly, to observe, uh, uh, Well, just, you know, when you know you're going to meet a certain person during the day or you're going to be in a certain situation in the morning, or do you have a certain kind of mood preparing for that? You know, like nothing's happened. The person's not even here. But just thinking that we're going to meet them, maybe there's some giddy feeling or maybe there's some feeling of dread, or, you know, who, who knows? But uh, do you see how, how we'll have some, you know, low-key emotional reaction, even though nobody is there and nothing has happened? Quite interesting, isn't it? Yeah. And it's all a projection of our mind. It's all fabricated by the mind. Yeah. I know that I'm going to see somebody who, in the past, uh, interrupted me a lot when I was trying to speak. And I know I'm going to see them. And it's like, they aren't even there, and already I feel intimidated. What's that about? Yeah. So somebody may explain, well, it's conditioning, it's like Pavlov's dog, you know? And so you're just, yeah, salivating that feeling because, you know, it's a conditioned response. Okay, 
But what's going on that that was the conditioned response? Because I could have felt many, many other things knowing that I was going to meet that person. Why did I choose that thing to feel? Okay. So, the, you know, to, to really notice the afflictions in our mind, these are the kind of things we have to be aware of. Because no. otherwise, often, we just go through the day and we're in one mood or another and we don't even know it. Yeah. You know, we're grouchy and we take it out on everybody around us and we're not... We're wondering why people are responding the way they are to us because we think we're just acting normally. So why are they so bent out of shape? Because we're not even aware that we're going... (laughs) Okay. Um... When you can't stand somebody that's better than you in a certain activity, that's jealousy. When you don't feel like doing anything but lounge around. Oh, that sounds so nice to do right now. (laughs) Yeah, that is the laziness of procrastination. Oh. When you put yourself down... That is the laziness of discouragement. Yeah. Do you notice when you put yourself down? Do you notice when you get into some kind of thing? Oh, I'm this, I'm that, I can't do this, well, I can't do that, well, nobody likes me, everybody hates me, eat, think, think I'll eat some worms, what's going on here? You know, I don't, can't stand this anymore, all oh, these people. Oh. Are you even aware that all that's going on? And you're putting yourself down? Or are you just, you know, thinking that everybody around you is just being mean and nasty? And it has nothing to do with you. Yeah. Well, they're they're being mean and nasty. I'm not in a bad mood. I'm in a very good mood. And I want to be cooperative, but these people are just so opinionated. Okay. Also observe your behavioral patterns. They can tell you if an affliction has arisen in your mind. Look at the examples I give. If you find yourself going to the refrigerator repeatedly, even though you aren't hungry, uh, uh, who does that? Not not me. Um, oh, my tree does that. <laughs> <laughs> the cats do that, yeah? Okay, we don't do that. Um, what affliction is present in your mind if you're doing that? Huh? Restlessness. Yeah, restlessness. Boredom. Boredom. Yeah, distraction. If you continually check social media, what affliction is propelling this action? If you cannot separate the phone from your hand, if they have grown together such that you would need intricate surgery to separate them, what is going on? Well, that's just normal behavior now, isn't it? Yeah, everybody does it. Everybody walks around with their phone in their hand, looking at their phone. Cross the street. Yeah. I've been in many cities. People crossing the street, looking at their phone as the cars rush by, almost hitting them. Yeah. Okay, so what, what what's going on in our mind when we're doing that? Okay. So what are you really seeking when you engage in that kind of behavior? Yeah. But what in specifically? 
when you're constantly checking social media? Hmm? Approval or praise, reputation. Yeah, very often. Approval, praise. I'm important because people are texting me. Yeah. Trying to make us feel, we're feeling insecure. Oh, I got so many, you know, texts. Yeah, all these people are trying to sell me things. They must really think I'm important. If that's how you get your sense of self-esteem, there's some problems. Okay? But it's interesting, isn't it? How we get totally addicted to that. Also, observe your behavior. Uh, Okay, we did that. Um, The next step is to differentiate constructive and and neutral thoughts from afflictions. Okay, so we've identified what's going on in our mind. Then we have to be able to say, is this virtuous, non-virtuous, or neutral? Okay, and we may think that we know what's virtuous, non-virtuous, and neutral. Yeah, and we may think when I help my friends and harm my enemies, I'm doing something virtuous. Yeah, if I help my friends, even if I'm you know, taking a little bit here that doesn't belong to me, that's okay, I'm helping somebody. Yeah, and when I'm harming the people who harm my friends, then I'm, I'm being really good, I'm, I'm protecting people. Okay. We often cannot tell the difference between <laughs> virtue and non-virtue. Yeah, we get very confused sometimes. Okay. In addition, some virtuous states of mind have what's called near enemies, afflictions that are similar to them. So, for example, love and attachment. So, these two are easily confused. They're similar in that both want somebody to be happy, but the reason they want somebody to be happy is very different, okay? So love freely extends goodwill broadly to many people, whereas attachment focuses on a small group of people, and attachment has expectations and strings attached. Okay, But both love and attachment seem to make us feel good. There's a happy feeling that arises along with them. So sometimes we confuse the two, and whenever we're experiencing attachment, we think it's actual love. Uh And if somebody asks us, what's the definition of love and what's the definition of attachment, we'll say, well, I, I heard that in a Dharma teaching, and it's written down in my notebook, but I can't remember it right now. Mm, then it's very helpful to you. Okay? So we have to tell the difference between those, not just intellectually, but in terms of our own inner workings, what's going on here. Righteous anger can be confused with compassion. That sounds strange, doesn't it? Righteous anger confused with compassion, yeah? because they both seek to eliminate injustice and other suffering. I'm angry because so-and-so, these people are exploiting so-and-so, you know, this other group, and that's not fair, and they're damaging them, and we've got to stop what they're doing. You know, we've got to protect this oppressed group from these monstrous other people who are just, you know, out of, out of their minds and what they're saying and doing. Okay, and we confuse that with compassion. Okay, because compassion also wants to alleviate suffering, and righteous anger wants to alleviate suffering. But again, they're very, very different. Okay, compassion seeks the best outcome for everybody concerned in the situation. 
And compassion is not involved in the blame game, trying to blame somebody for the whole thing. Uh, whereas righteous anger wants to harm those who we see as perpetrating the harm. And righteous anger wants to blame people. Okay? So in one way they have some similarities, in another way they're, they're very, very different. Okay, so can we tell the difference between these when they arise in our own minds? Sometimes we must tease apart different facets of a mental state to identify an affliction. For example, a friend deliberately runs a red light when there are no extenuating circumstances. Have you ever been in a car with somebody who does that? Who runs in a red life at, right? who runs a red light because they, you know, they don't see any cars around them at that time. And so they just zoom ahead through the intersection. You ever been in a car like that? Yeah? <laughs> you have? <laughs> yeah, I was in, uh, where was that? Mexico City, maybe. And somebody was taking me to the airport, and you know, so much of the time, just, huh, nobody's here, let's go. And, uh, you yeah. <laughs> know? Okay, so some people become angry at the driver, the agent who drove the car through the intersection. Other people disagree with the action, they see the action as endangering others. Okay, so the first is anger, because you're angry at the person who was driving the car. But the second is not, because you're just disagreeing with it. Okay, somebody says, well, I did it because there was uh, nobody uh, coming. And you say, that's not a good reason. But you can say that without being angry at the person. Okay. The more we can separate the person from their action, the more we can avoid anger at the person. You know, and it's anger at the person that is so dangerous. That's what destroys the merit. Yeah. Disagreeing with the action or calling out the action, you know, is, is not necessarily destructive unless we're angry at the person who did the action when we're calling out the action. Okay. So the more we can separate the person from his action, the more we can avoid anger at the person. This change in attitude enables us to have a reasonable discussion with the person about the possible effects of running a red light. Okay. And you can see that it's, so interesting, different uh, events, how, how people look at it and who they hold responsible for it. Okay? And uh, one example, when we were uh, um, put out this petition to ask for an, uh, an impartial investigation, of one lama's behavior to see if they did something quite inappropriate. Okay. Some people looked at, at us and said, bravo, what you're doing. Other people looked at the petition and said, what a great idea. Okay. And other people said, why are you bringing this up? It's going to ruin the reputation of Buddhism. And so they were blaming the messenger they were holding the messenger responsible for any turbulence in Buddhism's reputation and not the person who did the action that started the whole thing. Yeah. So it's, it's very interesting how, 
this happens and disagreement about the action. Some people say, well, the action was okay. And other people say, no, it wasn't. And some people say, well, it was okay, uh, but you can still ask for an investigation. And other people say the action wasn't okay, but you shouldn't bring it up. And other people say it wasn't okay, but you should bring it up. And yeah, it's it's quite interesting to see this whole variety of, of human responses and how you cannot make everybody happy. Yeah, you cannot please everybody. Yeah. Okay, so near enemies. Got to be careful about those. Mm -hmm. Okay, then next step in de dealing with the affliction is reflect on the disadvantages of whatever affliction is plaguing you. And that will give you the determination to apply its counterforces. So what, what are the disadvantages of jealousy? <laughs> what? You suffer. <laughs> yeah, this is true. You suffer. Yeah. Other disadvantages? It creates, yeah, it creates division. You miss the chance to rejoice in someone. Yeah. You miss the chance to rejoice in someone else's virtue or their good fortune or whatever it is. Yeah. What are the disadvantages of the laziness of discouragement? <laughs> you feel terrible, yeah. Yeah, you waste your precious human rebirth. You solidify a wrong view of yourself. You solidify a wrong view of yourself. And that habit of thinking just gets more and more attached. Yes, that habit of thinking, you just, you're developing a habit with it and it gets stronger and stronger. So then why do we keep doing it? Because it's entrenched. <laughs> because it's entrenched, okay. Yeah. When working to subdue our afflictions, it is best to choose the one that causes the biggest problem for us. Beginners in meditation often recognize that they have attachment to food. But that may not be the affliction that is the most problematic for them. Every meditation course for newcomers, this is what people, oh, I'm so attached to food. You know, everybody says, so attached to food. Okay, now, is that really the biggest affliction in your life that's causing the most harm? You know, Trump is attached to KFC. Is that the biggest, you know, problem? His biggest affliction? Yeah? That he likes Kentucky Fried Chicken? Yeah? It's from, Mid you know, Mitch's home state. He likes it. Yeah? Is that his biggest problem? What do you think? That, is that the one he should work on first? No. Yeah. Let him have his KFC. Let's have him work on some other stuff first. Okay. So the same thing goes for us. Yeah. So anger may be a bigger problem for that person uh, or for us because it interferes with our relationships at work and at home and it fuels all sorts of destructive behavior. Okay, can you see there that if somebody has a problem with anger, it's going to be much more disadvantageous than being attached to, you know, summer fruit or chocolate cake or raspberry whatever, I don't know. Yeah. Okay. So possessiveness uh, regarding other people, lusting for sexual pleasure, or greed for money or social status. 
may cause more difficulties in our lives and prompt more destructive karma than attachment to food. What do you think in your life? Are one of those more difficult for you than attachment to food? Okay. Possessiveness regarding other people. Anybody have that? That includes cats. <laughs> there are people, you know, who's possessive of their cat. Yeah. On the other hand, uh, okay. Uh, how about uh, lusting for sexual pleasure? That can create a lot of havoc in your life. Greed for money or social status? That messes things up. Okay. Uh, so these may cause more difficulties in our life and prompt more destructive karma than attachment to food. On the other hand, if you are overweight and in poor health and your doctor advises you to eat more healthily, attachment to food may be the affliction to work with first. Because if you don't, you're going to eat yourself to death and become very unhealthy. So, you know, it, all these things, it depends so much on the person and the situation. Okay. Now, if you say to yourself, I'm so bad because I have this affliction, what's that? Arrogance. Arrogance? Oh, no, you're not saying I'm, you're the worst of the worst. I'm so bad because I'm so bad because I lust for sexual pleasures, pleasure and have greed for money and social status. That's the laziness of discouragement. Okay, that's not arrogance. It's you're, you're discouraging yourself. Yeah, I'm so bad because da 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 woe is me i'll sit here and feel sorry for myself it's so pleasurable feeling sorry for myself because when i feel sorry for myself i have no responsibility for what i'm thinking or doing or feeling it's all somebody else's fault doesn't that feel good? We do that all the time, and it's really dumb, isn't it? Really dumb. Okay. If you work on the most problematic affliction at, at the outset of your practice, you'll see the positive effects Dharma practice can have on your life. Yeah, so really see what affliction really, you know, creates turmoil in your mind, makes your relationships kind of bleh, and creates a lot of negative karma. And work with that one. And if you really put some effort to it, into it, because that, that one may be very well entrenched, but it's also quite big. Yeah. So it's like a big tree that may have different roots, but it's a big tree. And you can start cutting off different branches of it. You know, and when you start cutting off the different branches, you see the the progress. You know, you begin to see a little bit of progress in working with that affliction, and when you see that, that gives you help, hope. Yeah, and you see, oh yes, this works. I, if I do keep doing it, it'll you know bring be better and more results. So one of the connotations of the word dharma is to hold back or to prevent. In the case of Buddha dharma, if we practice properly, it holds us back from samsaric dukkha or unsatisfactory experiences by subduing or destroying the afflictions. The dharma does this by providing the antidotes to these harmful mental factors. Everything taught in this book is meant to be a counterforce to the afflictions, their seeds, and latencies. So that's the whole practice, purpose of Dharma practice. 
is to counteract the afflictions. Okay, and there's many, many ways to do it. Yeah, the ultimate way to do it is the realization of emptiness, because that has the power to cut the affliction from its root. But that's a little bit difficult, and <laughs> you know, it's going to take us a while to realize emptiness. So, in the meantime, we have to learn other methods to help us deal with different things. Okay. And different teachers teach different methods, okay? And they're all rooted in the Dharma, so they're all okay, even though superficially they may seem different, okay? So, for example, in the Theravada tradition, and to some extent in uh, people who teach Dzogchen and Mahamudra, the idea is you just watch the afflictions and in just being there with it, not grabbing it, not pushing it away, then it just naturally subsides by itself. Okay? And for some people, that technique works extremely well. Okay? For me, I wasn't able to use that technique until after many, many years of practice. Because my mind when I have a strong affliction, thinks that affliction is reality. It's the correct response to something. And I get very deeply involved in the story supporting whatever situation it was that made that affliction arise. And until I can prove to myself that my take on that situation has nothing to do with reality. Yeah, until I can prove that to myself, I can't let go of the affliction. And so for me, if I just try, you know, this when I first started, if I just try to watch the afflictions, I would get as far as like maybe one second and then off I was ruminating on the story again, proving my case about why I'm right and they're wrong and uh, whatever it is, okay? It was only after a lot of time and again and again going over and saying, seeing how this mental state and my story behind it is unrealistic, that then I could say, okay, Maybe I'll try watching it and letting it arise and fade. But that's me as a person. Somebody else, yeah, may start out with just watching it be impermanent and find that very effective from, from, for them and use it for a long time. Or they may at some point start wanting to, to do the more analytical method. So, you know, we have to see what works for us at any particular time. Okay, so there are two types of counterforces. One is the all-encompassing counterforce that counteracts all afflictions. That's the realization of emptiness. The other consists of counterforces that are specific to each affliction. So the wisdom realizing emptiness is the all-encompassing encompassing counterforce that eradicates all afflictions. It directly opposes the ignorance, grasping inherent existence, which is the root of all the afflictions. Okay. While ignorance grasps all phenomena, including the I, to exist inherently, the wisdom realizing emptiness apprehends the emptiness of inherent existence of all persons and phenomena. Because ignorance and this kind of wisdom are diametrically opposed in the way that they uh, apprehend phenomena, because ignorance, and because ignorance is an erroneous consciousness, wisdom can overcome ignorance. Okay, so this is you know, again, something we really have to spend some time on the cushion thinking about, you know. Well, first of all, why is ignorance grasping at an inherently existing me a problem? 
I mean, we've been doing this since we were born and even before, and what's the problem with that? And everybody does it. Okay, so first of all, seeing that, and then beginning to understand, is there a, a, a counterforce to this kind of grasping? Can this grasping be eliminated? And if so, what is the counterforce? Okay, so it really takes uh, some time contemplating this to gain some confidence in it. Okay, and, and to know that when ignorance is uprooted, all the afflictions that depend on it also cease. We hear this a lot in teachings, but do we really get how those pieces fit together, or do we just repeat what we hear? Mm -hmm. Okay, so it, it's something that, that takes some thought. Other counterforces do not have the ability to eliminate ignorance, but are applied to individual afflictions. Since cultivating the wisdom realizing emptiness requires much time, we must learn and apply those more limited antidotes in the meantime, to prevent our afflictions from getting out of hand. Okay, so you 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 know you don't you can't use the atom bomb, so you use conventional weaponry, um, kind of like that. Okay, but that's an awful analogy. <laughs> Maybe it's more like you don't have Ajax, so you you use baking soda. Okay. <laughs> Okay, so some of the antidotes that we want to cultivate. To counteract attachment, craving, clinging, and greed, reflect on the impermanence of whatever person or object you are attached to. Okay. Now, do you want to contemplate on the impermanence of the whatever person, object, or whatever it is that you attach to? Do you want to contemplate on this impermanence? Oh, you do? Oh, very good. Okay, you don't. Why not? Yeah. We don't want to let it go. Something in our mind is saying, this is going to bring me happiness. And if I meditate on impermanence, then where am I ever going to get any samsaric pleasure? I need a little bit of happiness. What's wrong with that? You know? And then we get into some big distorted thing about, oh, Dharma is always saying happiness is bad and pleasure is bad and I'm meditating on impermanence so that I can get rid of pleasure and then all I do is feel like, Blah, I'm depressed, and you know what kind of what's Dharma teaching me? You know, I don't want to go around being depressed all the time. That's why I came to a Buddha center is to learn how to be undepressed. Okay, <laughs> yeah, you ever have that? Okay, so is is Dharma is the intention of Dharma to make you depressed? No. Okay. Why do you get depressed when you meditate on impermanence? Because you don't have a stable refuge. You're taking refuge in something that doesn't provide happiness. And yeah, you're yeah. upset about that. <laughs> yeah, you're taking refuge. Your source of happiness and comfort is some impermanent object. And when you realize it's impermanent, then you feel like the bottom's dropping out of your life. You have nothing to rely on. Yeah? It's like when you're a junkie, you know, you, you, you know it's harming you, but you really don't want to stop because it feels so good. Or when you're an alcoholic or, you know, or a social media addict or whatever we're addicted to. Okay? So... You know, somehow our view is very twisted and we're thinking that there's real happiness inside that person.
person or situation or thing. And if I don't have it, or if I have it and I lose it because it's impermanent, then I'm doomed. Okay? We don't see that impermanence also is what gives space for us to change. And that impermanence also brings forth something new in the next moment that could be quite beneficial and quite wonderful. Yeah? If everything were permanent, we could never become Buddhas. If everything were permanent, we would always be depressed. There would be no way to not be depressed. So it's impermanence that gives us space to change from depressed to happy. Okay. But then we think, oh, but if my, my, my thermos gets destroyed, you know, the thermos, it's been a family heirloom since my great, 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 great grand aunt, you know, passed down in the family and everybody's cherished it and used it. Reminds me of how much love all these ancestors I never knew had for me. I don't want to, you know, to think that my thermos is going to get broken. It's just, it's too painful. Okay. Is something wrong with your way of thinking if, you, if you're thinking like that? Yeah. Is something exaggerated? Yeah. If this thermos really had, was the source of happiness, how come everybody doesn't see it this way? Yeah. Well, it my belongs to all my great ancestors. Well, that's nice. Your great ancestors. Why am I attached to your great ancestors? Why are you attached to your great ancestors? Yeah. Anyway, they're dead, and here's a thermos that functions to hold water. That's quite nice, useful. But what, what's all this other stuff about this inner feeling, how it makes you feel comforted and loved, and uh, this uh, generation after generation of people who work so hard for their children, and they didn't even know me, but I'm the beneficiary of how hard they worked. And, and it's such a pretty color, pink. You know, just thinking of my thermos when I'm depressed brings love in my heart. You know, oh, that's, if it were really like that, then everybody should see it the same way. Yeah, do you have the same feeling for this thing? <laughs> yeah, anybody have the same feeling for it? But I bet you, you have something somewhere in your closet that you have that kind of feeling for. It was, reminds me, when I was little, I had some kind of very nostalgic tweak when I was little, because I used to look at old pictures and think, oh, all those people, you know, look at pictures of my parents and grandparents when they were little, and oh, they're so old now, and they're getting old, and da 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 so there was this very strong attachment, or nostalgia, which is a form of attachment. So I don't know why, but I, for a period I saved my old toothbrushes. <laughs> <laughs> because, what? Yes, I'm a daughter of a dentist, so yeah, it makes sense, doesn't it? Uh, you know, because they just would remind me of my childhood and how I was once young and grew up. And it's like, and then, you know, at a, a certain stage, I threw all of them out. Yeah, and then I started saving the napkins from every date I went on. 
you know, so that you could look back when you're 80 years old. And when I was 16, he asked me out to Burger King. <laughs> And you have a napkin to prove it, you know. And here's the ticket stub from when we went to see such and such a movie. And, yeah, and we save all this kind of junk and move it around, you know, because it has this sentimental value to us. But where's that sentimental value coming from? Is it in the object? No, it has nothing to do with the object. Somebody could take that napkin away and put in another one, and I would then have the same feeling towards the fake napkin. <laughs> yeah? I mean, that, that's, the I think, the theory behind uh, pacifiers and stuffed animals and all sorts of things. You know, why people, when a relative dies, they'll, they'll save the, um, the message on the, the answering machine that their relative said so that they could hear it again and hear their relative's voice, even though the relative died. Yeah. And so you, you hear your dad say, this is the household phone number, blah, blah, mm -hmm. please leave a message after the beep, beep. And then you listen to that and you feel so sentimental. And remember your dad. And yet, is that sound your father? You know, does it really have feelings of love in it? Or that's all just imputed by our mind, isn't it? Yeah. And then when it comes to having a garage sale and you want to sell all your precious family heirlooms, you know, because the, when they're, they're in your closet and it's like, oh, I got to move them. I might as well sell them and get something. But you put them out and, you know, here's the stuffed animal that your little sister used when she was a baby. And, you know, you're, you're charging, uh, you know, $50 for it. <laughs> and somebody comes along and says, $50 for this? And you say, yes, it's so precious. Well, it's precious to you because you've projected that on. But nobody wants to spend $50 for a torn up stuffed animal that your little sister used. Okay. So... I'm using this to, to see, to illustrate how our mind creates things and then gets attached to them and then thinks everybody should feel the same way about the things that we are attached to. And they don't. And then we have hurt feelings. Yeah. This is my whatever. <laughs> You gave it away. I cannot tell you. I mean, how many families have arguments about this? Yeah, one partner gives away something that the other partner hasn't used in 10 years and won't even think about. But as soon as this one says, oh, and by the way, I gave away your... Uh, mm -hmm. You did what? And a big fight ensues. It's so crazy. You know, when you really look at human beings, how we are. It's, it's nuts. And we join in the commotion, taking all this quite seriously. Okay. So, meditate on impermanence. No. The object is going to disintegrate. So why be attached to it? Enjoy it while it's here. Buddha did not say happiness is bad and pleasure is bad. You know, you hear His Holiness all the time say happiness is, you know, we want to be happy. And that's a natural wish for all of us. 
Okay? So nothing wrong with feeling happy. What come becomes the problem is this. I've got to have this. Okay? And if you think, do I really have to have it? Can I survive without it? You know, if we have a clear mind, we very often see, yeah, I can survive without it. But when we're deeply attached, it feels like we're going to die without this. Yeah. If my reputation gets ruined, I mean, how many people commit suicide because of their reputation getting ruined? Yeah? Why are you killing yourself? Because your reputation get, gets ruined. Your life is worth more, much more than other people's thoughts. Because that's all a reputation is, is other people's thoughts. Isn't a life worth more than that? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, okay, you have a bad, you lose your reputation. Then, yeah, you stand up and you do something else. Okay, and then also contemplating the unattractive aspects of the person or object also works well. So this is where the meditation on the 32 parts of the body works extremely well for attachment because you go through one by one, you know, doing the mindfulness of the body, looking at exactly what each part of the body is. And then you say, what is it that so captivates me? Yeah. That intestine is just, I faint when I see it. No, I'm not fainting because it's disgusting. I'm fainting because it's beautiful. Yeah. Don't you just love somebody? When you say I love you to somebody, you know, is it their intestines that you're loving? What are you exactly loving when you say I love you? Their intestine, their tongue, their bladder. Their ear. What are you what exactly are you loving? Yeah. Oh that front tooth. Let's pull it out. I want to look at it always. It's what I love. What exactly are we loving? I love their mind. Which mind? Yeah. Do you love them when they're angry? When they're blaming you and screaming at you? I love them always. Always. Yeah, that's the fairy tale. Yeah. This is quite interesting, you know. What is this body that we are so attached to? When you crave for existence in samsara, contemplate the disadvantages of samsara. This powerful antidote will redirect our aspiration to liberation. Yeah, very good antidote. To pacify anger and vengeance, cultivate fortitude. Okay, or cultivate love. That's the next one. To remedy hatred, hostility, resentment, and so forth, meditate on loving kindness. When you're angry, do you want to meditate on loving kindness towards that person? No! You want to blame them for everything. That's exactly why loving kindness is an antidote to anger, because it's the exact opposite. So whatever you don't feel like thinking about a person is the antidote, uh, antidote to whatever emotion 
you know, you're feeling. If you're attached to somebody, the last thing you want to think about is their, their downsides. Yeah. And if you're mad at somebody, the last thing you want to think about is their good sides. But that's exactly what we need to think about. Mm -hmm. To counteract conceit, contemplate the detailed divisions of phenomena, such as the 18 elements, the 12 sources, and the 12 links of dependent origination. See the enormity of what there is to understand. Seeing the enormity of what there is to understand, self-importance is deflated. Okay. In addition, by examining all the components of the self, attachment to a real self will diminish. Okay, That's the antidote to conceit. To counteract arrogance, reflect on the kindness of others. Seeing that our abilities, talents, and knowledge are due to the kindness of others deflates puffed-up pride. Because anything we do well, we weren't born with that knowledge or that ability. You know, we only have it because other people taught it to us or trained us. Yeah. And yet we, we have this feeling like, I'm so great, as if we had some idea that nobody else ever thought of before, or some ability that nobody else ever had, or that's independently mine. I came out of the womb, you know, with this. Simone Biles came out of the womb, you know, doing vaults, you know, and twists and everything. No, it, it came from other people who helped her. To reverse jealousy, rejoice at others' happiness, their good qualities and good opportunities, and especially their merit. Okay, Again, when you're jealous of somebody, the last thing you want to do is rejoice. But that is what is the antidote to jealousy. To remedy anxiety and deluded doubt, observe the breath. Focus your intention on the gentle flow of your breath without allowing the mind to spin with fabricated, self-centered stories. Okay, so that counteracts anxiety and doubt. If you are confused and cannot discern virtue from non-virtue, or discern what to practice from what to abandon on the path, then study the sutras and the scriptures, and they, because they will provide excellent guidance for that. And then to lessen disturbing emotions in general, remember that they are not you. Okay, They are not who you are, and they are not embedded in the nature of your mind. So any of these afflictions are adventitious. They are not the nature of, the, of our mind. They are not who we are. We don't have to always feel them. Okay, they're conditioned phenomena that are, you know, they they are compared with the the uh, smoke in the sky. They obscure the sky, but they're not part of the sky. So our afflictions are likewise. So don't get you know all uptight and discouraged if you get go through a period of time when your afflictions are really strong. Just remember, they aren't who I am. They aren't part of my mind. Yeah, they aren't who I am. They can be eliminated. That, that's very effective. Oh, say, okay, so questions, comments? I still think that my biggest attachment, when I think about my views and my opinions about things, mm. I still haven't quite the exaggeration that happens with objects, I have an, a little bit easier time figuring out, figuring out my exaggeration to my views and my opinions is a little bit harder for me to dismantle. Mm. Is there some way that, that you have found? Because they, they, they do seem, to, they just seem to be a lot more me. They seem to be a lot more true than me looking at my hand pruners in the garden shed. You know, I can 
work on my attachment to those, but my opinions and views, they're a lot harder for me to dismantle mm. the exaggeration and the importance of them. Okay. Does, does the attachment to them come up uh, only when, when people challenge them or when just normally when you're walking around all day? Usually when people challenge them. Yeah. I mean, they're, they're pretty... Uh, well, because I'm believing them as I walk around, there's no problem, you know. They're, they're <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> but if somebody gets in front of me and asks a question about something that I'm thinking or an idea that I'm having and have questions about it, that's where the defending, that's where the the rightness of it, that's when the, the data comes out and the the justification comes out. Yeah. So usually a challenge is what is brings. It, is it really the idea that you're attached to? Or is it uh, your image of yourself or your reputation with the other person for being somebody who knows this situation and who knows what's right? They are kind of do go hand in hand. Um. Boy, I have to think about that. I have to think about that. Okay. Yeah, think about it some. Because I see my I see my thoughts and my opinions having a basis in reality. Mm -hmm. And it's not it's sometimes about because I'm the one that's saying it, but sometimes I can actually say they have some sort of basis underneath them, some experience, some observation, some yeah. something right. that gives them some credibility. But if if they're really valid, why uh, why would it be a do problem? you get triggered when somebody challenges them? Yeah, yeah, that's the question. Yeah, that's that's the thing to to think about. Why did what gets triggered when somebody says, "Well, oh, why can't we put the prune, pruners here? <laughs> why can't we get the ones with the straight blade instead of those ones that go like this that don't cut?" You know, because I don't like those. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, because you don't like them. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll think about that. Because okay. I don't see the exaggeration. That's the part. So I yeah. think what you're asking me to do is to see the, the sense of self in the, in, in the I think. Yeah. Yeah, there's some sense of self that's getting mixed in with those loppers. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, looking through this list, I was thinking about also how important the motivation is when we apply the antidotes. Mm -hmm. Because that can make a really big difference in how and what we're able to do. So if, if, for example, if I'm angry and I, I'm i suffering because of that and I don't want to suffer, so therefore I'm applying this antidote mm -hmm. because I want happiness for myself, that probably will lead, that will have a positive impact if you try to generate loving kindness, but somewhat limited too compared to I'm angry, I'm suffering, and this is what beings are suffering. Mm -hmm. And may, you know, this feeling that suffering and just generating this sense of, of, of sadness for how much suffering other people must be experiencing mm -hmm. too. Mm -hmm. And then generating loving kindness. Yeah. It just the mod the maybe that's not even a motivation, but the attitude towards how are we applying these antidotes, I think. Yeah. Yeah. It's it. it's different ways of applying the antidotes. Mm -hmm. You know, one way is is like you said, I'm I'm suffering from my own anger and I just I want some peace of mind, so I'm going to, you know, kind of drop this. Versus, um, like you said, thinking how many other people are suffering from anger. And 
wow, you know, it's not only me suffering from anger, it's all these other people suffering from anger. And wouldn't it be nice if everybody were free from it? And then with that, then dropping your anger. Yeah. So they're, they're different. And, and you can see the the second antidote is much more expansive than the first one. But people have to use what's going to work for them in that particular moment. And for some people, you know, just the fact that it's causing me suffering is what's going to be the motivator to get them uh, to pull themselves out of the anger. Yeah. And then slowly, you know, as they hear more teachings, maybe they can expand that and think of the suffering everybody has because of anger. Yeah. So you use whatever uh, antidote works at that moment. <laughs> yeah. But as you said, yeah, what, what you're thinking, there's different ways to do it. And, and they will create different uh, results. You know. I was thinking one image that's worked a lot for me over the years, and I think it's a verse by Shanti Deva who says that we are like small children who build sand castles at the beach, right? And then when the tide comes in, and we stand there and scream and cry. <laughs> and the first time I read this, I remember thinking, oh, that's my whole life. <laughs> I mean, you spent years building up things. Yeah. And the tide comes in. Yeah. <laughs> And then you cry. It's Building so up whole images of who we want to be and what we want to have. And how, you know, just like, I'm going to get married and what your kids are going to look like and what you call and what you name them. I mean, people go on daydream extravaganzas. And then, yeah, then the tide comes in and the whole sandcastle <laughs> is gone. And we cry. And, yeah. We cry. What are we crying for? The castle of dreams and greatness and reputation is that the when that falls apart, it never existed to begin with. And so we're grieving something as a non-existent. I mean, we grie I grieve a lot about non-existences. I mean, they're things that don't <laughs> exist, and I yeah. grieve about them. They yeah. never happen. They never will happen, but there they are. Yeah, you know, and so we get upset because the future is not going to be what we want, and the same. It's a very similar dynamic to anxiety, because anxiety is we're, we're afraid of things that haven't happened that do not exist right now. Yeah, but we don't grieve those. We we cling on to them and think, but maybe they will happen. But it's true, you know, how much people uh, grieve the loss of their dreams that never came true. Yeah. And so there's some kind of uh, exaggeration of that, you know, if I do this or whatever that dream is, then I will be forever and ever, ever happy. Yeah. And, uh, and not able to see that there's so many sources of happiness and joy in life. Their, their mind's pinned on something, yeah, that maybe we were taught as kids that we should be, yeah, or have. Yeah, and then we grieve, oh. Yeah, so then people talk about bucket lists, you know. I want to go to Disneyland before I die. You know, Disneyland, the ultimate, you know, when you're a little kid, I remember it's like Disneyland. It's like, oh, if we, I mean, that was like the ultimate happiness of what we could have is going to Disneyland. Yeah. And then if you had a trip planned for Disneyland and then you did something naughty and you didn't get to go or it rained. How much, like, you know, this is just really, life is so much suffering. And it's only suffering because we're attached. Yeah. Only suffering because we're attached. If we weren't attached, we could go to Disneyland, enjoy it, 
And that was it. And we could not go to Disneyland and do something else and enjoy that instead. And that would be okay, too. How do you apply Dzogchen slash Theravada technique and Lam Rim together, but not confuse yourself on mixture of the techniques? <laughs> uh-huh. What's, it, that seems like a statement, or is that a question? <laughs> How do you apply them together, but not confuse yourself? Oh, you do one at one time and another at another time. You don't do them both at the same time. Yeah? How do you generate fortitude when you're angry? Uh, listen to the teachings on Thursday morning, 10 o'clock Pacific time. <laughs> we're going, we're just starting Shanti Deva's chapter six, and that is the ultimate instruction on how to generate fortitude when you're angry. Okay, or read His Holiness's book, Healing Anger, or my book, Working with Anger. And then practice what you learn. <laughs> That's the important part. Not just reading it, but practicing it. Okay, let's dedicate.